This video is a mix of conceptual and somewhat hardcore technical discussion around practical design of a CRISPR experiment. Generally, in a CRISPR experiment, you're interested in creating a stable, edited cell line. For this video, I will stick with mammalian cells as an example and use Cas9 nuclease to illustrate the ideas. Broadly speaking, there are two major types of CRISPR experiments. One where you are trying to remove a specific portion out of the genome. This experiment is called a knockout. A simpler form of KO is just a single cut to make indels, but I will use deletion as an example. The second experiment is to do the opposite, where you want to permanently insert a desired DNA sequence into the genome. This is a knock-in experiment. Deletion knockout typically relies on enjoining repairs, but you can also do HDR-based knockouts. On the other hand, knock-ins primarily rely on HDR repair pathway. For deletions, you need two separate Cas9s, whereas insertions can be done with a single Cas9. For a CRISPR experiment, the Cas9 and sgRNA can be provided by a plasmid that encodes both these features. Inside the cell, the plasmid is used as a template to make the RNA and the protein that self-assemble to form the active nuclease. One example of this plasmid is PX330. In contrast to plasmid, you can also just literally buy sgRNA and Cas9 protein, assemble the RNP in vitro, and directly deliver the RNP to the cells. The Cas9 is a fixed component of a CRISPR experiment. The targeting guide RNA changes and its design is typically the starting point of an experiment. I have a whole video on guide RNA design, and I have linked it below. For a typical Cas9 guide, you run through off and on target scores and efficiency, and make sure if you have a U6 promoter for guide expression, there is a G in the front, and hopefully the guide does not have a stretch of Ts longer than three nucleotides, otherwise RNA polymerase will terminate transcription. Typically, nucleotide repeats will lower the targeting efficiency. The rules around GC balance of a guide are still debated, but if you can get closer to 50% GC, it works out just fine. So, you've picked out guides, or a set of guides, that you want to use, and typically you want to experimentally measure their efficiency. This verification is done using a surveyor assay, or a T7 endonuclease assay. Both assays have the same concept. The difference is that one uses surveyor nucleus, also called cell 1 nucleus, from celery. The other uses T7 endonucleus 1 from T7 bacteriophage. Both nucleases do the same job. They find mismatched location in a double-stranded DNA duplex and make a double-stranded cut in that mismatched bubble. Here is how you can use them to test out CRISPR guides. You take your culture of cells and deliver the plasmid containing the guide in Cas9 or an assembled RNP. There are two observable outcomes in this experiment. Either a cell gets a cut by the Cas9, or it doesn't. If it gets cut, you can have a homozygous cut or a heterozygous cut. More often than not, DNA of most all the cut cells will eventually be repaired by enjoining mechanism. And because this experiment is done in a culture of thousands and millions of cells, each cut cell will be quite unique and therefore the result from end joining will be random and unique for each cell. Here's an example of a random set of indels that could be generated at a cut site by a guide that you are testing. Let's say you have them in three cells. In the wild type cells, you don't find these indels. Usually, you want to test out multiple guides to find the better one. So, in a second experiment, you have a different guide and say in that experiment, you have more cells that could have gotten the cut relative to the first guide. But we cannot see or observe these indels directly. So is there a way to measure and claim that guide 2 is better or more efficient than guide 1? Well, it turns out there's a trick to exploit these indels to get the answer. You can design primers that flank the cut site regions where you expect these short indels to be made. If you recall the guide RNA design video, ChopChop and CRISPR provide you with the pre-designed set of primers that you can use for this purpose. Using these primers, you do a PCR on the extracted DNA from your culture of cells following this experiment. Post-PCR, you denature and let the PCR products re-anneal with each other. So, in that annealing process, the individual strands of DNA will get mixed up to create heteroduplexes. 
and duplexes where indels exist will form a small mismatched bubble. You do this for both the guides independently. After annealing, you digest the products either using surveyor nuclease or T7 endonuclease and run the digested products on a gel. The annealed duplexes where a mismatch does not exist will not be cut by the nuclease. But if there is a duplex with a mismatched bubble, it will be split into two parts. The amount of brightness of the cut products is directly correlated to the efficiency of the guide RNA. So, from this example, if guide RNA2 gives you brighter A and B bands in comparison to guide number 1, you can infer that there are more unique cuts or indels generated, meaning that the second guide is better. One small caveat, which may be unclear. The A and B products need to be asymmetric, one large and one small, because if they were the same size, then it is harder to distinguish them on a gel, and you can also risk saturating the band intensity. I think we have our bases covered to talk about a CRISPR knockout experiment. By now, you conceptually understand how to design and verify guide sequences and you're ready to deliver the components to the cells. For a deletion KO, you use two PX330s with different guides and they form two different active nucleases. You can buy them as RNPs as well. Another option is to use PX333, which allows you to clone two guides into a single plasmid to result in the same outcomes. By and large, knockouts do not involve any donor DNA. And I'm going to call this a dirty KO, and you will see why. The two Cas9s will make cuts at the target spots, and end joining mechanism will paste the distal ends, and in this process, you expect the segment B to be removed from the genome. The pasting of A and C location will introduce indels into the genome. And because this experiment is done on thousands or millions of cells, each cell will potentially contain a unique and random indel. And that heterogeneity is why I call this a dirty KO. This is a preferred way to do a knockout. The second experiment, the knock-in, is quite intricate. In contrast to the dilution, knock-ins typically work just fine with a single targeting Cas9. But in addition to Cas9, you also provide a custom DNA containing your insert, this donor DNA can be in a plasmid form, a linear DNA, it can be double or single-stranded. For this discussion, I will focus on double-stranded DNA donor. After delivering these components into the cell, the Cas9 makes a cut in the genome, and your donor DNA with its homology region starts the homology-directed repair, leading to the insertion of any piece of DNA in between the homology regions. Let's go into some technical details on the donor design. Here's the example where I left off in the guide RNA design video. Say you want to insert something when a cut is made in this spot. But specifically, you may want the insertion to happen after this G nucleotide. This is quite a common scenario. NGGs are not available next to your specific point of insertion. As a general rule, your desired point of insertion should be less than 50 bases away from the predicted Cas9 cut site. This means that the homology region you will design is split exactly at the G nucleotide. You typically keep the homology regions around 500 to 1000 bases long. You can amplify them using PCR and insert your custom piece of DNA in between the homology regions. After the cut is made, long range resection will extend beyond the desired point of insertion, then HDR will come into play and the insert will be integrated into the genome. But this is where we get into some technical problems. After the homology repair is complete, you've recovered the cut site and the PAM sequence in the fresh original form as if a cut was never made. The Cas9 nuclease sticks around in the cells for a while, and it has all the time to recut the repaired genome again at that location. Heck, it might even cut the donor DNA into pieces because its homology region contains the PAM and the guide target as well. Hopefully, you see the issues. If the donor DNA is cut, the genome will never be repaired using the custom donor, and therefore, your experiment will be a failure. Second, even if it does repair, the repaired genome may be recut, and then you can get artifacts like multi insertions or indels that you don't want to see. So, the rule is to mutate the PAM sequence in the homology region to anything other than NGA or NAG so that the donor DNA is not cleaved, meaning that when the HDR is over, the genome becomes immune to retargeting. What if your cut site was here? 
Or, generally speaking, what if the insertion point falls within the target sequence? Now, what do you think needs to be done to the donor DNA? Let me know your answers down in the comments. So, that was a donor-based insertion that relies on HDR. You can also try to do a knockout with HDR. The idea is pretty simple. You get two Cas9s and a donor, except that the donor is missing a custom insert. And after HDR, the genome is missing a piece of DNA. And since this is an HDR-based process, the repair is expected not to give you any indels. And that is why I call this type of KO strategy a clean KO. Typically, only knock-ins use donor. It is super rare to find a use case for clean KO. Given this sort of knockout strategy, how do you think the donor DNA will change based on our discussion on knock-in donors? All right, so you set up the experiment. Doesn't matter if it's knock-in or knock-out, but what is the expected outcome? Well, some cells will get edited as hets, and diploid cells have two alleles, so you will get two types of hets. And some cells might get edited on both chromosomes, meaning they're homozygous. But a fair majority of the cell population remains unedited. And let's do some quick math to better understand this. The first variable is the probability that a plasmid or an RNP is actually delivered to a cell. Let's call this probability D. After delivery, there is a probability that any single target allele is edited by the Cas9. The chances of that, let's call it X. Then the probability of not editing the other allele is simply 1 minus X. If you were to calculate the probability of all heads, meaning that any allele can be edited, it would look something like this, which gives you 2x times 1 minus x. The probability of two alleles being edited within a cell is simply x squared. Finally, the probability that none of the allele get edited is 1 minus x squared. Now that we have these formulas, let's say that the probability of delivery is 0.7, or 70% chance and assume that the probability of editing any single allele is 0.2. Assume that you have a thousand cells in culture. Now, given the numbers and formulas, we can get the expected proportion of hets and homes in our CRISPR experiment. Given our somewhat realistic assumptions about probabilities, you notice that the non-editing fraction of cells is quite higher than the editing fraction. So how do you go about increasing the odds of obtaining the edited cell population? One way is to select, and the other way is to screen. Both of these are quite relevant for knock-ins because you can add an antibiotic marker along with the insert that you can use to kill all the non-edited cells. Alternatively, for both KO and KI, you can also co-deliver an additional piece of plasmid containing the antibiotic marker and use the episomal nature of the plasmid to select cells with cargo delivery for two to four days. This is useful if you do not want to add a marker into the genome. For screening, you can use a color marker instead, or in addition to the selection marker, like a fluorescent protein. And you can do this episomally as well, but it would require fax or microscopy-based selection to isolate the target population. In case of episomal delivery, both selection and screening is equivalent because you're not screening or selecting the edited population. You're only selecting or screening cells that have successfully received the cargo. Episomal delivery could be used if cargo delivery efficiency is poor. Otherwise, it's not super great at increasing the odds of getting an edited cell population. If you have added a marker into the donor insert, at least for knock-ins, then you are truly screening or selecting the edited cells. After increasing the odds, it is time to isolate single cells that will become a pure cell line. For this, you blindly expand 50 to 200 cells. And you can get single cells using fax, serial dilution, or even single cell colonies using cloning rings, or any other preferred method. Once you have 50 to about 200 cells expanded, you extract DNA from their colonies and perform validation. Depending on the need, you may be searching for a HET or a homozygously edited cell population. If it is a HET, maybe you care about the allelic bias. So how do you search for these cells? This is called screening validation. And let's do this for knockouts first. This one's actually fairly straightforward. You design primers flanking the region you expect to lose. 
and check for the shift in band sizes following the PCR. You can use PCR to also check for hets and homozygosity of the cell population. A pure shift is one way. Alternatively, you can use a third primer to check if the cells are hets or not. For a het, you expect primer 1 and 3 to give you a PCR product, and you expect that 1 and 2 will give you a shift in the PCR product. For homozygous lines, the primers 1 and 3 will not work, but 1 and 2 will give you a shifted PCR product. The idea for knock-in validation is pretty similar. You design primers around the insertion point and inside the insert. The primers 1 and 2, which are around the insertion point, should be outside of the homology regions. For HETs, you expect to find one PCR with a small size and the other with a larger size. And this band shift alone is enough to tell you whether the cells are HETs or not. As a validation of insertion, you should do a PCR with 1 and 3 anyways. For homozygous cells, you expect the longer product from primers 1 and 2. Essentially, a single pair of primers that gives you a shift in the band size is enough to validate the HETs and HOMES in both knock-ins and knockouts. The story for homozygously edited cells ends here. This is enough to say that you have pure cells if results align with expectation. But you may be interested in HETs with a specific allelic bias in both KO and KI. So how do you screen validate cells if you want allelic bias? Let me demonstrate this with knockouts. To identify allelic bias, you ideally need to have SNPs outside one of the cut sites. Here I have AT pair on one allele and CG pair on the other. The workflow is identical as we have already seen. You design the same 1, 2, and 3 primers, and you want the SNP to be part of the amplified PCR product. After getting the PCR product, you Sanger sequence the product and check which SNP is part of that product. If primer 1 and 2 give you a CG pair, then you have a head population that is deleted on the CG allele. If the primer 1 and 2 gives you an AT pair, then it is a HET for AT allele. For knock-in, you follow the same principle of checking for SNPs. The only caveat is that SNP should not be within the homology region, just like the primer. And now that you have an edited cell line, or many cell lines, you are now ready to do further experiments.